I carried on with, with Adams for a number of years, uh, got to the giddy heights of being a marketing director and probably earned the most money I've ever earned whilst doing that job. But I was also the unhappiest I've ever been. You know, when we start out, we don't always know what we want to do, whether it's going from college, university into work, or indeed, even when you want to go from work and start your own business. And listening to Bob's interview, you will hear this is a great example of somebody who really didn't know what they wanted to do. And by a strange kind of synchronicity of different events, he ended up doing today exactly the job that he loves doing. So listen to Bob and enjoy his story. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Bob. How are you today? Really good, thanks, Michael. Really good. It's always good to have conversations with inspirational people. So thanks for having me on. Oh, amazing. Thank you for that. <laughs> that's it. I should be complimenting you, not the other way around. But that's great. And thank you for coming on. I'm, I'm really delighted. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. So I always start with the same question, and that is for you to share a little bit about your personal life, where you were born, a bit about your education, where you now live, maybe a bit about your family if you wish to, but you don't have to, and then any hobbies and interests, just so people get a sense of who Bob is behind the persona, the trainer, the speaker, and all of the other great things you do. Um, so over to you. Well, I was born in Coventry uh, quite a while ago. My parents were from uh, Dublin and they came over here um, primarily um, for work. And because at the time they came over, there was a labor shortage in this in, in the country. And uh, we grew up sort of a working class family, a happy family. I was one of four boys. So that uh, that created its own fun and its own I can challenges. Imagine, yeah. <laughs> and uh, education wise, I I was always I'd always describe myself as uh, above average, mm. uh, not um, in in the junior school that I went to. I was top of the class cons consistently in maths and English because at the time I was at school. Those were the only things that were tested. Yes. Uh, yes. When I got to secondary school, you're starting to mix with a, a lar much larger group of people. But I'd always class myself as having above average intelligence. And I was always good at anything that I was interested in. And I'm sure that's true for most people. Yeah. But yeah. I used to love uh, English, English literature, history, geography. Uh, and I seem to have a, um, a good way with, with numbers as well. I got, um, I got through the school system, only came away, out, away with uh, four O levels in the subjects already mentioned. Mm. And then uh, I decided to go out and, and look for a job. And I got offered a job with a, an insurance firm called Equity and, Equity and Law. Sorry about that. Equity yeah. and Law. Yeah, I know them. And... Yeah. And at the time, they said, well, you know, we can offer you this job, which is, uh, it was a, just an admin job. But they said, if you go on to college and get yourself a diploma in business studies, we have a graduate scheme that we think you might be very interested in. So I wasn't in, in any rush to uh, uh, go and uh, do an admin job. So I thought, well, try that. It sounds quite exciting. So I went to college. And in hindsight, college probably wasn't a great move for me <laughs> because at school, uh, discipline was everything. Yes. And so so you constantly pushed and constantly uh, organized. And then, so after five years at school, I then went to college. And at college, the first day, they said, you're an adult. You need to look after yourself. And the truth was, I probably wasn't an adult. No. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, again, as with the school experience, I had 
subjects that I excelled in because I was interested in them and I enjoyed them. But there were plenty that um, subjects like law were incredibly dry and, and difficult. Um, some of the economics uh, topics were, were actually um, dealt with very, very poorly in terms of, you know, trying to interest somebody of my age. And um, I, I, I struggled. I did get a pass, but I, I scraped a pass. Oh, OK. And so, and so at that point, I was thinking, OK, I've got what I need. I can go back to equity and law. But that was at the time that was the early 80s and uh, the country was in recession. And unsurprisingly, equity and law weren't doing uh, the, the scheme. Oh. But, you know, those things happen. I mean, I had no... I had no clear idea of what I wanted to do. No. In in term in terms of a job, I, I'm I always find it interesting to meet young people these days who are very clear in terms of what they what they want to do, and it's and it's a gr it is a great thing. But if you don't know, you don't know. Mm. Um, so at the time when I was at college, I had done a bar job, and I was I didn't want to go on the dole after coming out of of, of college, and university was a no no after scraping through at college. Mm. So I I found at the at the bar that I was working at that they would give me a lot more hours. So I decided to to practically work there um, for you know full time. Mm. And whilst I was there, I met somebody uh, who worked behind the bar who worked in an engineering company, and she got me an interview at a an engineering firm in in Coventry, wow. and uh, and I got the job there. And, and what the, what job was that? It was a sales uh, estimator and and rep for for distributors. It was a a Danish company called Unbreco, and they made these high tensile socket screws. Um, their most famous or infamous. Uh, product was they made some parts for things like the fourth bridge and the gullwing doors on the DeLorean car. Oh my god! So, so it, it was it, it the the product itself wasn't wasn't particularly exciting, but it was it was fun working with the uh, the distributors all around the country. It was mainly um, telephone work, but um, I, I enjoyed it. Um, it. It paid the way, but it was very much a a job. I'd go there in the morning, do the work, and I'd leave and not think anything more about that. Mm. Yeah, uh, you know, and uh, work with an, a, a nice uh, group of people. In fact, work with the uh, first couple of people who, for different reasons, were were uh, a big inspiration for me. There was a, a chap called Michael Kurtzberg, and Michael was highly enthusiastic, <laughs> and basically in a company that was mostly depressing and depressed oh, he was highly enthusiastic and he got a lot of grief and back talk from lots of people simply because he was so different mm. but actually i was more attracted to his way of approaching work than i was the the crowd sitting there going everything's terrible everything's going wrong yes and then the second person who who um, was very good was a chap called Stan Ben. And Stan was a couple of years off retirement when I joined, and he was he was he was very good. At, he would spend time with me, talking to me about uh, the next level up in terms of um, of estimating, mm. and introduced me to a lot of really uh, interesting ideas. And actually, you know, spent time that he didn't need to spend. Because he was a an expert on our department, he was he was very very busy. People wanted his time, but uh, w he, without wanting anything back, he just gave uh, his time uh, to me, which 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 you know again sort of greatly appreciated. Wow. Okay, so I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? What when you say about the subject matters that we're interested in, and the same goes for work as well, doesn't it? So just going to work and going through the process of just doing something uh, for earning, but not really necessarily having your heart and soul into it. And, um, and really, partially, that is the problem with people being in employment, perhaps not enjoying it, not getting fulfilled. So w what happened next? Well, 
after being there for a couple of years, one of the the regular things, and it, and it was true very much of a lot of um, British engineering and inju- industry at the time, almost every six months there were some redundancies. Yes. And what happened was people that you got on with and worked with for, for really well, for a, for a period of about a month every six months, would suddenly become really difficult and unpleasant to work with simply because they were all trying to guard and not be the ones that were being made redundant. Of course. And so it was, it was quite a um, depressing thing. And it was, a, it was a cycle that didn't seem to be changing. So I, I, was, I looked for another job and I got a job at a company called Adam's Children's Wear. I knew nothing about the company. They, were, they had um, stores around uh, the UK, but I was working, going to work for them in, in stock distribution and logistics simply because the actual nature of the job were um, a set of skills that I had. Yes. And so uh, I went along and uh, and joined them, and again, a uh, small team that I was working with, but but nice people, uh, e- easy to work with, a job that I could do very easily. In fact, one of the things that I often remark upon is that for the first year that I did that job, we for some reason we started at ten to nine in the morning and finished at five, <laughs> but. At quarter to five every day during that first year, we, the whole team, there were four of us in this particular office, would be sat at very clean desks with no paperwork, <laughs> waiting for five o'clock so that we could go home. <gasps> and w- so each day there was nothing in the trays to be done. Nothing. It, it had all been done. Yeah. And the first year w- was like that because at that time in in retail, and this was children's uh, fashion. Yes. Actually, they ran the businesses on on four um, very independent seasons. Yes. And so, what would happen would be that you would get to the uh, end of the winter um, stock. All the winter stock would have gone out probably by beginning of December. Then during January, you'd have a month of sale. And during January, the stock would come in for the spring. That's right. And and so you would have these very um, clear periods where work was done and that was it. There was nothing else to do. Mm. What changed was that the company started to do uh, seasons that overlapped. Yeah. So, you know, when you get to the end of the summer season in retail, which would be sort of August, September time. Yeah. Very often you've still got summer weather. Yes, I know. And, and at the time the stores were, sh- were, were selling winter clothes. I know. So heavyweight winter clothes. So the idea was that you would overlap it. You would get a transitional range that would come in. And then as soon as the transitional ranges came in from that day onwards, we always went home with stuff to do tomorrow. And that from that day onwards, I don't think anything's changed. I think every day there is always more work. I don't get to the end of a day where everything is, is done, Never. but that's okay. <laughs> oh and, yeah. I mean, it's fascinating. I, I mean, as you, you may know, and we may have touched on this, I don't know, but I've worked in the, in the textile industry for 28 years in all the different um, supplier route into mainly Marks and Spencer. And I could never understand why, you know, winter merchandise went out in August uh, when it was still warm and the sales started in August to get rid of all the summer stuff. I mean, of course, I understand it. And, and yes, and it did become more transitional. But even so, we know that come January... And we're now talking in December and in January, we know that, you know, swimwear is going to be in the stores in January. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, I I keep getting every time I go to a a supermarket, you know, as soon as something one season has finished, something that's going to be happening in six months time suddenly starts to be stocked in there. Yes. Um, And it, I hear people moaning about it, but I think, you know, work in retail and, and somehow it, it might make a bit of sense. Not a lot. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Okay. So Adams, yeah. So Adams, the great thing about Adams was that they had 
just a few months earlier been taken over by the Sears group. Mm. And at the time it was taken over, they had about um, 50 stores nationwide. But Sears had bought them because they recognized that this was a chain that probably could have 300 or more stores. And so at the time that I that I joined them, Sears were putting a lot of uh, capital investment into Adams and it was growing at, a, at an incredible rate. And, and the benefit there was that as this company grew, then there were more and more um, j- different jobs and different positions that were needed. So I every uh, 12 or 15 months, I was getting a promotion into a different area. Again, at this stage, I had no idea what it was I wanted to do. So I was just trying lots of different jobs. I worked in 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 buying. I worked in in retailing. I worked in overseas franchising. Lots of different jobs. And then um, the the quirk at the time with with marketing and market research was that most of it was done centrally. So we were part of the. Uh, men's and children's wear groups so most of it was done centrally yes but the, the business reached a stage where it needed its own marketing department so two people who were part of the central team that were based over in birmingham moved to the head office which was at nuneaton and then i joined them as if you like the adams specialist because i'd worked around a whole load of different departments then I brought the Adams knowledge and they brought a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge about marketing and market research and strategy. And and so I took over my, uh, market research uh, when they came over. I had a great mentor, uh, um, a woman called, um, Car- she's now Karen Bycroft. She was, she was phenomenal. She was a- exceptionally good at what she did. And also she stood out because she would never bend her principles. She would rather if people sacked her than her uh, bend her principles, which was challenging sometimes to work for her, but actually was just such a great uh, role model and uh, and just a, a person of such high integrity to work with, which which was fantastic. But the other marvelous thing about about working on market research was for the first time, I was doing something that felt like more than a job. Yeah. And I was doing something where whilst working on that at home, I was I was buying books. I was uh, buying programs to learn more and to be better at it because I, I, I was absolutely fascinated primarily by this idea that you'd listen to people talking about why they do the things they do. Yes. You know, they're not lying, but, you know, that what they're saying doesn't match what they do, <laughs> and 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 I was I was just incredibly uh, uh, interested in this, and it, and and that's where I suddenly became aware and and very interested in terms of how much of your life was run by your subconscious. Yes, <laughs> and 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 that's it's it's the basis of so much of of the stuff that, that, that I do these days in terms of working with people on being better communicators is, is telling them so often that so much of what you have to do is you have to make a connection with, with the subconscious. If you really want to, to be effective and you really want to do that. And, and, and a lot of the stuff that I learned during that period really introduced me to that idea. Um, I carried on with, with Adams for a number of years, uh, got to the giddy heights of being a marketing director and probably earned the most money I've ever earned whilst doing that job. But I was also the unhappiest I've ever been. Wow. And and that was because I was working probably technically six and a half days a week. Yeah. And most of my time was spent in meetings and meetings that really didn't achieve a huge amount mm. we were just going through the same thing again and again each week and it was uh, and uh, the sad thing was i had a really good team that worked for me and you know v- some very very Im- impressive individuals that i didn't get to spend enough time with uh, and also because of the the way the, the company had made a lot of its money was about buying a lot of its product 
on long lead times so that you could get really cheap cost prices. Yes. And that allowed them to not only sell in their own stores, but to actually sell in places like Sainsbury's and Boots, because there was enough margin there for both to make some money. Wow. But the problem with that was that we're doing that at a time when all the other retailers realized that what you could do on short lead times is respond better to fashion trends. Yeah. So every time we were getting stuff delivered, it was stuff that we'd uh, research samples maybe three, six months before that people had loved. But by the time they were arriving with us, they'd already been in our competitors for three months and most people had bought them. Yeah. So yeah. I had a, ma- a really talented marketing team whose prime job was how can you say we're on sale without saying we're on sale? <sighs> and, and it's just such a waste of, of, of good talent. And and so uh, you know with with all with all those elements coming out, it it was a, a really unsatisfactory uh, role, and so maybe time to move on. Really, I know, and you know there are some retailers in this current day and age whose model is all about how to be in sale constantly. So two spring to mind, and that is, and we're talking in the UK here, Sports Direct and an organization called or a retailer called DFS who sell furniture and they are always in that process and it must be soul destroying for for the staff <laughs> to constantly be selling stuff that is in sale but i suppose if that's what you do i guess you don't know any better then that's what the model is and and well, do- I- Sorry, carry on. Do Adam's Children's Wear still exist today? Only as uh, an internet brand. Right. The the problem was that was it was such a an important strategy for them, and it was so big. And if you've got a stra- if you've got a strategy that you're running your whole business on at a time when the income coming in is declining, you haven't got the capital, the money that you need to to change things around and mm. you haven't got the confidence to do it. And so it you know, part of the reason um I think why a lot of um, good people went was that it was just a, a slowly decreasing business that just wasn't it wasn't going to turn around. Mm. Um, just just to pick up on, on one of the companies that you you, you mentioned before, uh, DFS. I actually I, I've done quite a bit of work with DFS over the over the last few years. Oh right, and um, it's 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 very interesting that perception. I've 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 heard that from a few people, but actually it, they they operate. It, I mean, they're a they're a, they're actually a wonderful business. I should I'm, here. I'm I'm not not trying to. I'm not on commission. No. I, I have no. to add that they're a wonderful. They're a wonderful business and. What they do do is they they invest a lot of money in their in the couple of sales campaigns that they have. Yes, uh, they sell a lot of, of of product at full price, and they they do you know they they are they are misunderstood. And I think they're there. There's definitely been a, a historical thing. I think mm. with them, but um, the the thing I love about about the job that I have is that the so I started working with them probably about six years ago. Uh, the first time I went in, that was exactly my impression. How you described it was exactly what I thought that was the business I was going to go and work with. Yes, and and you you get inside, you meet the people w- within that business, and it's it's just so different. I mean, they are a phenomenal um, company in terms of um, corporate social responsibility, in terms of the amount of money that they raise um, for the charities. It, it, they're phenomenal in terms of the way that they um, uh, treat their staff and 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 train their staff. It, it's it's a real eye opener. And I've had I've had a few occasions where I've worked with companies where I've had a similar view like that, and then been massively surprised by just how that organization works and how well it it runs because mm-hmm. they're 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 actually a very successful business doing what they're doing but then I've also had the reverse I've had companies that I've m- admired greatly and then gone and worked with them and been massively disappointed yeah. um, in terms of how they are in terms of a, a culture uh, uh, and other elements and so you know I think one of the nice things and I think one of the things that's true in all life, not just in business, 
but very often it's great it's better to have a strong opinion about somebody once you've actually met them talk to them and then form your opinion uh, i i agree and thank you for sharing that because i would never have known that and and at the same time what why are they i guess not doing more to to help change that perception because i'm sure i'm not the only one with that perception um but i mean having said that i did buy a product from them many many years ago and i was very very happy with it <laughs> um so oh but it's it's good to hear that they are such a great organization and yeah i'll have to change my mind about them but well, but you're right least... you're right we have to we have to hold back judgment until we know either an organization better or the individual better. This is this thing about the subconscious again. I mean, within a few seconds, we are forming opinions about people and about organizations, and it all comes from our experiences to date. And and it, it, it's, a, it's a useful thing because it's, it's a shorthand. We don't have the time to meet everybody on the planet and form an individual opinion on them. Mm. But actually, I'm always surprised by some of the differences from a first impression with somebody to when you actually get to know them. And, um, it, it, you know, it's, it, it's one of those things where there's, there's kind of, there's, there's a lot of animosity on this planet today. And, and I think a huge amount of it could be solved simply by at, at getting a few minutes and, listening to somebody and then telling somebody a little bit about you. you it's so true and you know what what is making it worse in this current time and that is of course social media where people yeah. are forming opinions about individuals by what they may share what they say even about how they construct their profiles because i have to say, regrettably, I form opinions about people every single day when I see a profile and go, actually, that isn't congruent or it doesn't look right or it doesn't sound right. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it's not getting any better, that's for sure. I think it's just getting worse and more, more troublesome <laughs> in this day and age. My my hope with social media is that it it, it reaches a point where people realise the again it's not that social media itself is 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 a bad thing because in theory it should be a very good thing but yeah and it does a lot of good as well it, yeah and it, for for me the the big challenge is is the confirmation bias yes and then combining that with algorithms that bring you everything that confirm what you already think and and i think there will get to a to a time and i don't know how long it'll take but i think there will get to a time where more people will be wise to this uh, and and i would hope then they would actually be able to make some some better decisions but it's uh it's a little bit of a rough ride at the moment for for anybody who wants to say anything on social media totally totally okay so Adam's children's wear, and so six and a half days um, working to the bone and not really being happy, stuck in meetings. I know exactly what that's like. Um, so what did you decide to do after that, Bob? Well, I, I, I went and had a couple of interviews elsewhere for uh, jobs in other retailers at a similar level. And I got offered one of them and I was pleased about that. But when I sat down and thought about it, I was thinking, am I just going into the same situation with a different product? Yeah. And so I decided that, that that gave me the confidence that actually if I, this might be the, might be a time to try something different. And, and up until then I had no great desire to work for myself, but I would in the last few months, one of the good things that came out of, of, working at Adams was I worked with a consultant, a guy called Simon Gulliford, who had been a marketing consultant for quite a, a time. And 
he spoke to me and, and said, he, he gave me a, a couple of thoughts about maybe why it might be worth trying this. Uh, he was also he was also the source of two great pieces of, of advice for me when I started out. And um, the first one was get yourself a good accountant. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, make sure that you spend your time working on your business, not trying to save a little bit of money here and there on things that people will do much better for you. And the second thing, which was uh, which is has served me well for for many years is that once you learn something give it away because that forces you to learn something else mm. and, and and so he he was he was really uh, very useful in terms of in terms of uh, going and giving it a go and setting up and and initially what I, I did was i had a, a retail and marketing consultancy so i was doing some market research and some some strategy work but at the same time, as a hobby, I was doing uh, uh, amateur theatre. Right. And, uh, something that, that, that I enjoyed doing. And somebody I worked with at a, a, a place called the Talisman in Kenilworth was a, a director called Sue Tears. And she had been um, a professional uh, theatre director, but she did what I do now, which was coach and train speakers. and. We got on on really well, and in fact, we we ran a um, class together on a, a Monday night for those people in the theatre who were only getting non-speaking bit parts, and ran a class to to try and help them to get better parts, get more speaking parts, and and get more out of that. And she was always talking about the the job that she did, and it sounded really interesting, and and so she became. Uh, a mentor for me in terms of 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 speaker coaching and what i brought to speaker coaching was the the psycho psychology element which was understanding audiences understanding um lots of things that that turn people on turn people off but she gave me a huge help in terms of the performance side of of coaching right. which obviously from her theater background was um was something that she was very knowledgeable on and and so gradually um, over a few years, I changed the balance of the work that I was doing and and then was predominantly doing um, speaker coaching and speaker training, which which just I, I, I have always loved and I, and I still love now. Wow. And so did you literally go out of Adam's Children's Wear from day one to setting up your business day two? Or how did that transition Happen. Well, uh, that was the plan. Yeah, uh, it, it got interrupted by jury service. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> I, I, it was. It, it couldn't have been more poorly planned. Oh. Um, but in uh, the January of uh, of ninety eight, I got. Uh, I'd never done jury service before. I got a request to do jury service. And there was a whole list of reasons why you could opt out. And I was thinking, well, I'm setting up a business. Maybe that's a good reason to opt out. Mm. And But uh, they weren't having any of it. So I was I was compelled to do a fortnight of jury service. Wow. And unfortunately, that's uh, on one side, it took a little bit of momentum out because I, I was starting after after Christmas it took a little bit of the momentum out, you know, having been prepared for this start in January. But the other thing that it did is most of the time on jury service, so uh, I spent the time sitting uh, reading books. So I got to read some um, very, very uh, good books. And um, also at that point, uh, just on a on the strength of an advert, I bought a, a cassette tape, which has a long ago, it is cassette tape. <laughs> <laughs> for a program called The Achiever's Edge by Peter Thompson. Right. And right. and that was a it that was a really interesting program because it was it was a, a business audio program which had a selection of, of, of chapters on it. Some things were hints and tips about different uh, elements of business. There was always a guest interview, and then there was always an excerpt from uh, a, a Nightingale Conant program. So these are um uh, business programs yes. um, on 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 a variety of subjects, and it was it was great because it was a a, 
a, a whole range of different thoughts and different ideas. And, and every month I'd at least get one or two ideas or one or two um, sources of, of more information. So a lot of books that I read were off the back of um, thoughts and ideas from this program. So, so that was quite a, a lucky and a useful thing to find uh, at the beginning. But I was literally up and running. And interesting enough, having spent a long time in marketing and having spent millions of pounds of somebody else's money mm. to learn what works and what doesn't, uh, my own marketing program was simply to get in contact with people that I'd known over the years and say, do you want to meet for a coffee? Let me tell you about what I'm doing. Why don't you tell me about what you're doing? Mm -hmm. And that's been my that's been my main marketing program uh, these last few years as well. So, brilliant. Okay, so and then literally starting to going to theatre, then doing the speaker coaching, and your marketing program speaking to people that's it in a nutshell is it uh, that's it i mean it, it took uh, it took a little bit of a while to to get going because mm. uh, when you start talking to people and telling them about what you're doing unless you're incredibly lucky and you speak to them on the day that they need your services all you're doing with them is planting a seed yeah uh, but what what was good I, i'd gone i think it was about four months before I got my first paid job. And, and what was, what was good about that was actually in the previous month, I had gone to see somebody at a, um, a, a company that sold computers that wanted a strategic program and a market research project done. And it was it was very very good money, and I had a long conversation with with this person. But I actually I felt that the project they were doing was flawed. That even if I did all the work and delivered them all the results, it wasn't going to move them forward with the challenge that they had. Mm. And we had we had long discussions uh, about about some of those challenges. And even at the end of those discussions. They still said, do you want to do this? Right. And, and I said, no. Okay. <laughs> and, and even though I hadn't earned a penny doing this at that point, it was one of the happiest days because I made a decision that was right for me and I made a decision that was right for them. And, and it, it, you know, in more ways it really hurt because it was a nice bit of money. It hurt to w walk away from it, but it, it was absolutely the right decision. And, uh, over these last years, any time where I have not heeded that advice, inevitably it it doesn't work for me and it doesn't work for the client. Yeah, you have to have a relationship and you have to ha you have to know that what you do is going to add value to them. And that's a really tough call when when people are starting their business from scratch. They've put in all the work in terms of you know, knowing what they want to do, being passionate about it, doing their marketing, their discussions, their, and then getting an offer to do a job. It, it's a really tough call, isn't it, to say, do I walk away or do I, do I compromise my own stance just because I need to earn money? It, it, it yeah, it was a really, really tough call. Mm. But having said that, I, I, I mentioned um, Karen Bycroft early on, and actually one of the things that said that I picked up from her was was actually the importance of integrity. Just in, in terms of your long term health, happiness, etc. Um, whilst working as a marketing director, I think I compromised a lot s some of the values in order to have things run in in the odd way that they were running but uh, to actually then break free from that and be given the opportunity to make your own choices then it was really important to make the good choice as as as, as difficult as it was i, I don't I, I don't want to underplay this for, for anyone that who's in a similar position i don't want to say that you know 
it is easy, that it isn't a, a challenge. But all I would say is in the long term, uh, and and for yourself, you know, be able to to look in the mirror at the end of the day and say, you know, are you doing are you doing the right things? Are you doing are you doing a good job? Are you are you are you actually making a difference for people? I, I think it's really important to make those right decisions when you have the opportunity to. I I I think it's a wonderful example. I'm so glad that you've mentioned this this topic because it's so important for people, and we're, and. And hopefully this, this podcast is being listened to by people who are thinking about starting their own business or even those that are now in business but want to take it to the next level or want to give it another push. And we all make these mistakes. You know, I've made them several times whereby, you know, people have asked to partner with me on something and I have and then I've regretted it later down the road. And and even the last one is about probably about 12 months ago where I was asked to join to do something specifically without going into detail because it's not fair on the, the people involved. But I was asked to lead an organization which would have taken me away from what I'm most passionate about. And it literally took me, it took me over a week to decide no. It was really tough, you know, because at some level there is there is there is this ego that walks into the room and goes, oh, they want me. And then that and then there is the they want me and there is the promise of money. And both of these things are really sway you in a certain direction. And to then turn around and say no, which I did at the time was very liberating and it felt as you ex explained really really good and several you know a year later i know it was absolutely the right decision as well yeah and and i don't know about you but you know after i made that decision i was really happy with it but there were mornings i woke up thinking did i do the right thing yeah sure but but, but as you say you, you know over time that it is the right thing to do mm. i I've I've found over time that lots of times it is worth working out whether the people that you are are working with are are absolutely on 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 board in terms of 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 what you're doing and what you're looking to do with them. Challenge is always a fantastic thing, but it, for me, it's the way people challenge. And and one of the consistent things I find is that there are uh, many people who when they challenge they're talking about how can we make this better and then the want people that are more challenging are those who are just challenging so that they can be heard yes and and at a, that's okay at a at a sort of a junior and middle level because i think it takes time to develop your own uh, sense of yourself and 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 what you can do when you're very senior in the business and that's the way that that you're approaching things then typically that's the time when i'm thinking no may, maybe maybe you and i aren't right together maybe we maybe we're not going to um create the best value for each other uh, you know over time and and anyone i work with i'd like to think that i could work with them over time yeah and it's it's i think it is important and i i've worked with charities and with one particular organization on identifying a set of values for themselves and you know it's often a, um, a misunderstood set of principles of having values for an organization even if you're an organization of one it's really important to identify what kind of values you want to run your business by and do business with other people with on those values and also declare them and communicate them openly and transparently. And I learned this from a social media scheduling company called Buffer. And I've really, this is a sm smallish organization of around 50, 50 to 100 people, I think now, but 
they have a really open, transparent way of working and they had a set of values. And I, I couldn't believe that a company like that would declare their values so openly to the world. But in fact, they declare everything openly to the world. And it was then that I decided, although I'd been in business for a while, to actually write my own values for my company and actually share it with people. And so I th once you have those and then go into business or do business with people, you can always check back at the values and go, yeah, am I, is this client meeting my values <laughs> as well? Because they're important to me and then they should be important to them too when we're working together and going into, you can't always go, oh, here are my values, you know, like as an official contract, can we just sign them off type of thing. But if you're aware of them and they're part of who you are, then you can always refer back to them and go, does this client really meet my values or not? I don't know. Yeah, well, I think it, it depends. It depends on on the on the sorts of business. I think if you're in the if you're in the information business, which I suppose in a lot of ways we are. Yes. Then you are looking for uh, longer term uh, relationships with people. You don't want to just. Um, work with somebody once and then never never hear from them i mean i i know because when we've discussed this uh, elsewhere mm. we're mm. both interested in in how the people we work with are getting on <laughs> it's nice to think that if you've helped somebody with something that actually it's good to know that it made a real difference for them yes and so so it's good from that point of view but the other thing that's good from the point of view of running an informational business is if you're working with people on a on a regular basis if you're working with them year after year Again, in order for you to bring value to them, you have got to be learning new stuff. You have got to be bringing new stuff to them. Yes. Because they're yes. not going to be, uh, be buying the same stuff again and again and again. And 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 I love that. I mean, one of the things I when I when I think about my own education, one of the huge things that was missing from my education, and and I know there are um, some teachers because I have some some uh, friends who are teachers who who actually subtly but effectively bring this through. One of the best things that any education system can do is encourage people to be lifelong learners. Yes. And, and th there's such, I mean, the, na the nature of, of modern living anyway is that there are very few jobs for life anyway. And so you have to be learning and retraining just if you want to be uh, in employment but actually it's such a um, a positive and gratifying thing to be learning new things all the time and you know i've been running my business for, for 20 years and i as much as i know and i, I feel like I, I have really put the hours in and 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 know a lot i still think there is significantly more out there that i don't know and that excites me. Yeah, that, absolutely. That, that, that's the situation. And, and go on. Uh, all, all I was going to say, and and having an incentive to be like that helps to make it become a habit, and then something that happens naturally. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it is the only way that we can succeed. Really, I I'm now since I left education. And when I went into do some personal development for myself, which was around, well, it's, it's well over a decade ago now, probably 15 years ago now. And it's only when I started to realize that there was some such a thing as becoming, you know, learning about other things that I haven't stopped learning since then. And I learned more in the past say 15 years than I did in all of my education years, you know, it's incredible. Um, there's so much to learn out there. There's no question about it. I, I totally agree with you. I, I feel like once I left school, I went for about 15 years without really learning anything significant. Yeah. But once, once the desire to re-educate kicked in, the, some of the things that I learned and I found were just phenomenal. And and it, I, I can always 
remember consistently catching myself saying, if only I knew that when I was 18, if only I knew, you know, where would I be now? It's not a, re- not a, re- not a regret thing. Cause I think regret is, is mostly a waste of time, but it was a regular occurrence because there was just such magical stuff out there to learn. Uh, and particularly about, about us, the way we think, the way we do things. Uh, and also some of the things that, that give us a, incredible capability. And, and when it, for instance, for me, actually finding your voice, being able to stand up and talk in front of, uh, of an audience is a phenomenal thing. I, I've, I've worked with a lot of people, a lot of good people who, after I've, we've worked together, they've been promoted. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not, that's not me saying, I'm brilliant, I got them promoted. They were always promotable. They, they did a great job. They were they were very good, very competent, very enthusiastic. But what they lacked was profile. Yes. And and working with them, getting them to stand up in front of the people that ultimately make the decisions, because they're very rarely their own line managers. Their own line managers can influence, but very rarely make the, the final decision. To actually get up in front of those people that make the final decisions and suddenly be seen and heard, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite an amazing thing. And I think for anyone who is ambitious, then being able to stand up in front of a group of people and sell yourself or your ideas is such an important thing. It's it's the only thing that people need if they wish to succeed in business because I've seen so many people come to networking events and even then it might only they stand for 60 seconds or a couple of minutes presenting themselves in front of a group of maybe... 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe 80 people um, and do their little promotion about their business. And you can just see the confidence drain out of people when they when they have to realise they've got to stand up and do this 60 seconds commercial, which they're just not capable of doing. So, you know, it's so important when you go into business for yourself that you have that skill. And one of the things I did, it might be a tip for people, but obviously you know, they should be contacting you. Uh, <laughs> and also I did, I joined Toastmasters for a few months, you know, for about six months or something to train myself. Um, so it was like self-help, you know, I didn't know there were speaker coaches out there like you. I had no idea they they existed even when I started doing it. And the bizarre thing is, there's just a tiny little story I'll share with you. When I was, I had to do my first talk which was only seven minutes long to this group of people and it's a safe environment because people then give you some feedback and they support you and you're not doing this actually for real in front of a client or anything like that and I was still employed and I was driving commuting to work and it was in the evening that I had to deliver this little talk this speech for seven minutes and the talk was only about myself. So even the subject matter was easy, you know. And I was rehearsing this talk in my head and out loud in the car because no one was with me. And I was, I was getting butterflies in my stomach. I was, and I went, how ridiculous is this? Your body has no, isn't even in the location. How can it deliver butterflies just by your brain thinking about seeing yourself in that talk. How's that even possible? <laughs> you know, when you talk about the subconscious and all of that, it was just crazy. And But from that day forward, I never looked back. And I'm not suggesting that I'm a really accomplished speaker. I've got so much more to learn. And at the same time, I know that I, I can get by I can do a reasonable job, but if it wasn't for me having done that all those years ago, it would have really not assisted me in my business at all. Well, I, that that is that's that is a great story, and I think I, I think there are a lot of people out there which who, who I'm sure are probably a few steps before doing what you you did there mm. that maybe <laughs> might might help them think might might help give them the incentive to move that a little bit forward. Yeah, I, I think yeah. the, the interesting thing for me about about all the the range of speakers that I've that I've worked with that that I've listened to over the years, uh, I think speakers are a lot like um, uh, musicians and and particularly uh, 
particularly singers. I, I have really broad taste in music and there are so many great singers and, and what great singers do is they sing the right song. And so I, I like um, people like Tom Waits, who has a very, very gravelly uh, voice. And a lot of people wouldn't necessarily um, class him as, as a great singer, but but I, I, I love him. But I, I also like, uh, you know, people like, you've got people like Freddie Mercury, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Plant, who have just such strong and, and powerful voices. And then people like Adele. And, you know, just there's a whole range of people who've got great voices. But what great singers do is they sing the song that's right for them. And I believe it's the same thing with speakers. Everybody has got... If they tell the right story, they have the perfect voice for it. And so sometimes people will listen to somebody and think, oh, they sound so brilliant. I don't sound like that. Well, actually, that's just they're singing their song. You need to think about what is my song and how do I sing my song? Wow. I've never heard anybody explain it in that way. And that's perfect. It makes total sense to me now. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Oh, wow. You've never heard me sing, though, have you, Michael? No. <laughs> <laughs> do you have to in theatre? Do you have to do singing? Uh, I, I did it once <laughs> because it was on a list of, of things to do. But I... I I'd never, I've never been trained as a singer. One of my best friends has got a fantastic singing voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, he came along and saw this show and uh, he mentions it quite regularly. <laughs> but it, 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 was a, it was the right song for my voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, I'll, I'll just stick with happy birthday, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow. Listen, we 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 could literally talk for hours and I've got a few questions I must ask you. Sure. Um so with how long have you been running your business, Bob? So this is my 20th year now. Wow. Okay. So could you find uh, some areas that you went through in your business that you found challenging? And and equally also, what what have been some of the highlights as well in your business over the last twenty years? Okay, so in terms of challenge, the the major challenge has been because for most of those twenty years, what I've been doing is selling time for money. Yeah, and so getting the work to fall when it suits you is incredibly difficult thing. Uh, it's more common that when all you're doing is selling time for money is that you'll have two people wanting your time, but then they'll want it on the same day. Yeah. And and so whilst I think anybody who is in that situation where that they're selling their time, I think it's sensible to look for some way to supplement that. And um, obviously, uh, um, I've, I've, I've written a, a book. I'm writing a second one at the moment. And actually having some uh, other products that can tick over, I think, is a sensible thing. Because in 20 years, I've not solved how to land all the, the jobs that require my time so mm -hmm. that they all sit nicely in together. So, so that's, for me, one of the biggest challenges. The second challenge that, again, probably took me over 10 years to work out was that regardless of the state of the economy, if I'm not busy, it's because I'm not working hard enough. Yeah. I'm not contacting enough people. I'm not, I'm not getting out and about enough. I'm not, I'm not identifying where there are some opportunities. There are times, and, and, and you know, again, I think um, if you're working for yourself, sometimes you can have these natural ebbs and flows where you think you've worked really hard for a time and you want a little bit of a lazy time. That's fine, but there's always a cost for the lazy time. Yes. But I, I think anyone sitting at home say, thinking to themselves, um, things aren't working, there isn't business out there, first question you've got to ask yourself is, are you working hard enough and are you working smart enough? Yeah. I think... I think those those two things I've talked about there, I think over the 20 years, they've been the biggest challenges. That, and the things that when you start to solve those, things do get much easier. Brilliant. 
Perfect. And uh, and tell us tell us what your book book and book to come is. Okay. Well, my my first book was called uh, No Rules, and No Rules was a is is a general book. Um, it covers a number of areas about about actually being a good and effective speaker. And it, it's based upon the idea that a lot of the organizations I go into, the people who are who are who I'm working with, that there's quite this general thing of if they have to do a presentation, what they immediately do is switch the computer on, go into PowerPoint and start putting slides together. Yes. And and the reason they do this is because everything they've experienced before they've actually had to present themselves are people doing exactly that. Yeah. And yet what they have never thought to themselves is, is well, this is boring uh, and I'm not actually getting anything out of this, but they think this is the way things are done. Mm. And so there are, there are, there's a belief that the, there are rules in place that people have to follow. And, and my challenge to speakers is that, is that there aren't any rules. And, and the book is about a series of guidelines and considerations that help um, people along uh, in terms of their being more effective as a, as a speaker. Love the it. second book, which, second book, which is uh, out next month is, oh, sorry, I'm saying next month. I don't know when this is going out. So it's out in January, 2018 is, is all about storytelling, which is obviously very appropriate for the, for the podcast. Yes. Consistently the best and most effective and best remembered um, key points are all delivered via stories. Yeah. There's um, there's a chap that um, I, I work with at a company called Frontier. His name's uh, Mark Aitchison, and uh, he works with um, his his uh, marketing director Sharon Kennett. And together, when they when they work together on a presentation, there's always a great story in there. Mm -hmm. I, I've worked with them over again quite a number of years, and I can remember all the stories that he has told they just you know and it, it's about stuff that isn't necessarily um relevant to me but i can i can remember the, the those really well and and consistently the storytellers are the ones that first of all they entertain they engage but they leave people with more um information and more understanding and i think that that's the important thing about it so there is a there's a wealth that can be gained from bringing a storytelling approach to I would say the vast majority of business presentations. I totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. Most business presentations that I see are the most boring experiences I will ever experience. Literally, <laughs> I'd, I'd rather yeah. go and watch a great movie <laughs> than watch these presentations. They're just so yeah. bad. I, uh, I have a term which I use called the snore fest. <laughs> And I, I've had to attend so many snore fests over over the years that it's always great when you've got um, people and material that, that stand out and that are different. It, it, it's phenomenal. And you know something? It's not difficult to stand out because you're right. People believe that the rules are PowerPoint and mm. bullet points and reading from the PowerPoint. That's what people believe presenting is. That's how they're taught. And maybe they've actually never been taught, but what they have seen is other people do it. And I always say Microsoft, I'm sure is a great company, but one of the worst products they have ever invented was PowerPoint. And it's so overused and misused. Uh, don't get me wrong. The product itself is there's nothing wrong with it. It's the way that people use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, uh, that's exactly it. I mean, I I I was at an, an event last week um, with some great um, graphics people and speakers who were very open to presenting differently from the norm, and we just had some phenomenal um, picture slides that just created a fantastic visual, but allowed you to totally listen and be with the speaker. Yeah. And this is in yeah. a, this is to an audience of a couple of thousand people with, you know, these colossal screens there. And even with that, you know, they weren't tempted to fill it up with lots of stuff. Actually, they used it incredibly effectively and it just makes such a big difference. Totally, totally. Okay. So, um, 
we, we focused a bit on challenges. So I want to get out just one highlight in your last 20 years. Oh, one. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, that there there's been so there's been there has been so many it's it's been fantastic um right, right. i'm not I, i've i've worked with a few famous people but i think that's a, a that would be a, a lazy answer to include that just because uh they're famous mm. that's still good that's a highlight for sure <laughs> definitely uh, well I, okay um well I, I'll, I'll i'll talk about um uh, a chap called uh, Jeff Thompson. And Jeff is, uh, some people will, will be familiar. Jeff Wright has written quite a number of self help books. Um, he's a multiple martial artist mm. and uh, was actually asked to teach at um, Chuck Connors School over in, in America. Uh, he's also a BAFTA award winning screenwriter. And for all of those elements, when I when when I met him and worked with him, he was slightly concerned. Uh, I hope you won't mind me saying this. Slightly concerned about talking to an audience. Right. And uh, once uh, we worked it, so that, uh, really what what we did initially was got him to sit down on a sofa with somebody and have a conversation with somebody in the presence of everybody else. And he was, he was great. He was, he was, um, relaxed and comfortable and himself and, and it worked, it worked beautifully. And the, the thing, I, I, the reason why that that's highlight is, is it was such a, I think it was such a, um, positive experience for him. And, um, I, I don't believe it's a, a challenge for him uh, these days to, to talk to people. I think he, he's he's really good at that, and he's such a such a great bloke. Such 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 interesting stories, and and also for somebody who uh, is a multiple martial artist, such a um, centered and qu quiet. You you wouldn't you, you you'd be mistaken if you looked at him and think this guy is gentle and couldn't look after himself. Yeah. I'm sure people might, might make a mistake. It, it, just, just a really lovely guy. But one of the things that that experience that helped me was realizing, cause this was relatively early on. It, it was realizing that actually one of the dynamics that you could play with is that just because it was a presentation, it didn't mean you had to stand somebody on their own in front of an audience. There were lots of things where the, the, great insight with working with Jeff is that when uh, I met him first, uh, we were sat on a sofa talking and he was really, really comfortable. It, all this stuff was flowing out. He was really comfortable doing that. So why not replicate, find out where somebody's comfortable and replicate that yeah. for the stage. Yeah. And I've done that quite a number of times um, since. Um, I also, I, I worked for a, a short time with, uh, with Robbie Williams and that was one of those we were talking about um prejudging people yes and i was i i, I would have to i'll admit i was in, very nervous about working with him because um at the time uh, you know i read read a lot about him he's one of those people that obviously you can read a huge amount and i was unsure about what kind of person this was going to be what kind of experience this was going to be mm. And, um, yeah, when I met him, uh, you, you couldn't have met anybody more charming. And, uh, and, and also I, I worked with him, I only worked with him a, a few times, but every time one of the things that came through from him was just how well mannered he was and how much he cared about what people would call the little people. Yeah. Um, he was, you know, he was very, he was very um thoughtful and considerate and and made sure it wasn't just about you know um going in and talking to the all the high profile people all the people that that could possibly make a difference for him and and that that experience with him um completely changed what i i had read previously which was a mixed a very mixed thing yeah uh, and so 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 from that point of view that that was that was really good but um as i say it's it's difficult to pick things out because Part of doing the job that I'm doing, it, one, one of the incentives for doing it is that when I get home at the end of a working day, 
one of the things I want to be able to to do is look in the mirror and say, did I make a difference for anybody today? And and one of the great things about this job is that I've been lucky enough to be able to answer yes on so many occasions, even if it's only a small thing. Yes. And 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 that was the incentive for leaving my job because there were many days when I or I got home and I thought I can't I didn't make a difference for anyone. In fact, if I hadn't have turned up, would it have changed anything? And that's not a great place to be. No. Wow, Bob, thank you for sharing those couple of stories. I'm glad I asked the question. They're brilliant. And and you have definitely made a massive difference to a lot of people that are listening to this. So thank you. And unfortunately, we're coming to the end. Yep. And um, there are, I still have so many questions I'd like to ask. And But for now, um, my last question is, how can people get in touch with you? Where can they locate you on the web? And I know you prefer the face-to-face -face talking over a coffee as well, uh, but can they find you digitally as well, Bob? Yeah, initially, I, um, because of the uh, bringing the book out uh, in January 2018, uh, I, I've not... I haven't got a website at the moment. I'm building a website, and and the and the reason, for the reluctance always with a website is that I don't like the idea of of having built a website and then nothing changing, nothing happening. Mm. And and in the past, it's not been enough of it. There's not been enough incentive for me to to keep writing and keep adding, so that there's a reason for people to come back. Whereas what I've been working with over the past couple of months is. Uh, content that would would keep a website interesting. So, um, the website will be up, but probably not for not till uh, for a couple of months. Yeah. The easiest thing is LinkedIn. Okay. But, like you, please tell me why you want to link in. Uh, I, 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 if you send me the standard LinkedIn message, yeah. I I I take your advice on this, and I will ask the question. Why, you know, why did you want to link in? Because if you're, if you're going to just click that, I don't know whether you're real, not real. I don't know if you're just adding numbers. I'm really happy. There are, I don't think I've turned down anybody. In fact, I haven't. I haven't turned down anyone who sent a personal message. So just send a short personal message. It doesn't have to be a, a huge reason, but give me a, give me a reason. And, and I'm very happy to connect. And, and for those people who don't know how to do that, <laughs> but just the the most important thing is to go to the person's profile don't view them in a in a list where you just see the connect button go to that profile click the connect button and then it gives you the option to add a note if you go on mobile then there are some dots or whatever the latest version is you will find somewhere where you can do it on mobile as well i think the biggest problem bob is that people don't know where to add it the linkedin still yeah. haven't got this Although we've spoken to them for years about this when I um, was doing my LinkedIn training, um, they they still haven't made it consistent for people, you see. So they're scared, I believe, because they haven't tackled this properly, that they need to grow their network. And if they put a block in where everybody has to add a note, that means they're not going to grow their network as fast. And they've probably been one of the slowest growing networks, but they've been growing consistently. Um, so they have this like, you know, oh, do we stop people until they put a note in or do we just tell them to just click connect? And at the moment, I probably might, I might get one in 50 that add a personal note. Well, I'm, I'm following your great advice. Mm. Anybody mm. listening to this, if they do happen to send me the standard LinkedIn message, I, I will follow that up with a question back. So I will Perfect. give them, I'll, I'll give them the opportunity. And so thank you for that advice. That that has been really useful. Okay, so that's how people can get in touch with you. Use LinkedIn, and the website's going to be there sometime in 2018. The book, yep. the book's going to be out in January 2018. There's a book there now. I will include a link in the show notes to that book. Um, that that. I think it was published in, what, 2015, was it? 2015, that's right, yeah. yeah. So that's called No Rules, so they can learn more about what you do and, and get some great tips and advice about No Rules. I love that title, No Rules for Presenting. Um, apart from, don't use PowerPoint. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. Bob, thank you so much for joining me on the Show Story podcast, and I'm sure we will see each other again in 2018. I'm definitely looking forward 
to seeing your book in January as well. So take care and all the best and thanks again. No, thank you, Mike. It's been a genuine pleasure. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 